This morning, I would like to continue from where we left off last week, and that's not uncommon, uh, because we do preach the Word in serious form. Uh, today is the fifth uh, session, the fifth uh, message, if you like, in our prayer series. Pastor Vanessa has done the first three. Or, um, uh, I ministered last week. Um, in fact, uh, I'm having a sense that I'm less, much less emotional this morning than what I was last week. And um, I wasn't crying during praise and worship. I said, it's a pretty good chance that I get throughout the whole service without sobbing. <laughs> In fact, I was looking back, uh, and uh, last week there was somewhat profound um, to me in the sense that, uh, you know, when, uh, in terms of preparing to, to minister the word, I, I pray, and uh, I guess typically we endeavor to get a, a hold of God and get a hold of the anointing and so forth. But last week, it was the other way around. I really sensed that God got a hold of me, and I was being apprehended by the Spirit of God. In fact, I listened to the message because there's a bunch of stuff that kind of came out that I hadn't in the remotest plane to say, and parts of it I felt was kind of quite uh, <laughs> prophetic and, uh, and so forth. But anyway, because uh, I listened to myself, which I generally don't do, uh, I mean on recording, and of course, I listen to myself, and the first thing I want to do is join English lessons, um, <laughs> specifically elocution lesson, you know, the whole aspect of pronouncing English words properly and everything. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, uh, we're trusting God that God will speak to us again this morning. And whilst I said that I'm not very emotional today, anything is liable to happen. <laughs> All right, so just, just you just be relaxing and allow the Spirit of God to... Um, just let us flow through what God has for us. And uh, this is once again an opportunity for God to speak to us and God to, to uh, rearrange things in our lives. And you know, God does that. God rearranges things. Somebody said once, do I have to change before I come to God? We said, no, no, come as you are. But once we're with God, it's like God begins from that moment forward to change us. Somebody said, well, I'll change first and then I come to God. You can't change to the level that God wants you to change. Only God can do that in and through us. Uh, and so that's an important aspect for us to understand uh, that uh, in terms of God changing us, you know, there's, God loves us enough to receive us the way that we are, but he loves us too much to leave us the way that we are. He changes us. And that change is ongoing. Don't anybody ever think that we have arrived. All right. Um, so anyway, praise God. Um, the title of uh, this series of messages is, I give myself to prayer. And I've put a subtitle there this week. Uh, I suppose I should have put it there last week. And uh, last week somehow became all about men being called to prayer. That wasn't like planned. That was kind of the way that it headed towards his, I began to prepare and I really felt a burden and a sense like God is really calling men to pray. Uh, the opening scripture that we used there, and this is just by way of recap, uh, briefly in Psalm 109 verse 4, uh, David speaking, he says, I give myself to prayer. Uh, and I said there that David had quite a bit of trouble at that time. The people were accusing him of all sorts of things. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's kind of, it's not uncommon. You know, the spirit of accusation is still alive today as well. Uh, just likes to use some people to accuse other people. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, David said, oh, I'm having trouble here, God. They, they are saying this against me and they're saying that against me. And, and they are returning my love with, with all of these accusations. But he says, I give myself to prayer. And I said that, uh, you know, that's the right thing to do, but it is not uncommon for us to press into prayer when we've got a hard time going on, uh, when we have a need. We press into prayer, but God wants us to press in all the time, in the good times and, and, and in the challenging times. And we looked into the NIV translation of the Bible, New International Version, where David says, I am a man of prayer. And I believe that uh, eventually every Christian man uh, should get to the place where he's comfortably able to say, I am a man of prayer. Right. Jesus was a man of prayer. Um, and so uh, basically to summarize that God is currently speaking to us about prayer, he's stirring our hearts afresh. Um, and this is not a new thing. God is always stirring hearts and so forth, but God is maneuvering us into the place where he wants us to be and uh, at this point in time, the focus is in the area 
of prayer. We looked at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, where Paul says, I desire therefore that the man pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. And we noted there that when Paul says, I want men to, to, to uh, uh, pray everywhere, uh, we said that he's actually speaking about the males, the men. This is not just as in, you know, I want mankind everywhere to pray or humankind. He says, I want men to pray. Of course, God wants women to pray as well. Um, and women do pray uh, mostly. Uh, in fact, we said that women tend to gravitate towards prayer more easily than what men do. Men tend to be doers. They want to fix, they want to get in there and get the job done. Uh, but there's certain things that we cannot do and most certainly cannot do it in our own strength. So uh, that's part of the reason why God calls us to pray. Uh, very quickly, we made a few statements there and we said that God is calling men to pray uh, because the man is the priest in his home and the spiritual leader of his family. All right, that's God's design. That is God's intent. That is God's ideal. Now, how do you know that, that we don't live in an ideal world? But because we don't live in an ideal world, we aim for the ideal. And this is God's plan. We said that the wife is... And the children are under the spiritual covering, covering of uh, her husband or, in the children's case, of their father. And we said that uh, through prayer and seeking God for wisdom and direction, a husband and a father establishes a spiritual covering of safety and protection for his family. And I said last week that, uh, that uh, the demands on man is huge. It's a tall order. Um, and, uh, and I said that in terms of the requirements on me as a man to pray uh, and on me to be the husband that God's called me to be and the father, the order is tall. It, the, the demand is huge. And I've got my own challenges in this area, my own. So I'm not here to point fingers. And I said that it's not helpful to point at men and to point out their faults. Men need to be encouraged. Men also need to be lifted up in prayer for that matter and, and so forth. And, of course, husband and wife should be able to pray for each other and stand in the gap for each other. So um, I'm not planning to... Uh, repeat everything that we said last week. If you weren't here last week, I'd encourage you to jump on the website and listen to the message. In fact, go right back to Pastor Vanessa's first message. God is doing something in the life of the church. We are on a journey. In fact, I was very mindful this morning coming down here uh, into the auditorium and, uh, and come down at 9 o'clock for our prayer meeting. By the way, I invite you to join us at 9 o'clock for our prayer meeting if you can make it. Something powerful happens every time. But uh, I came down and uh, I realized that, you know, like uh, sometimes we pray and we invite God, but when I got here, God was already here. Um, in fact, we sometimes speak about a residual anointing. There was a ladies meeting going on yesterday. And when there's a meeting the day before, we're stepping into a higher level of the presence of God when we come here. I don't know if that's ever, uh, you ever noticed that, but I've consistently I've found that to be the case. Um, and how cool is that when we get here and uh, think, all right, let's now pray God. We're here, so let's invite God to come. And we get here and God's got ahead of us. God's already here. How cool is that? You know what that means is that God is really keen to meet with us. Uh, God showed that way back in the Garden of Eden when he met with Adam and Eve, and he came, and, uh, and he wanted to fellowship with them in the cool of the day. Uh, and God still wants to fellowship with men. God likes to hang out with us, and we ought to want to hang out with God. Um, so uh, it is very clear in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament that God is intended for men to be the spiritual leaders of their family. And you know, today... And last week is not in any way about knocking women back or in any way putting them down. But the message is for men. Um, I'm always thrilled for everything that everybody does. But it really thrills me when men get up and take responsibility. Even just a couple of things going on here during the service. There's a real thrill in my heart when men rise up to take their place in leadership rather than hang back. And let the missus do everything. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, and so God is stirring our hearts. And God wants men and women to each find their place. I had an interesting discussion last week in regards to, you know, one lady said, well, my husband 
for all intents and purposes is not saved, and, and, but I am, and I'm praying, what does that mean? Um, had a little discussion around that. You know, sometimes we do everything we can to, to lay out as everything as clearly as what we can, but we leave gaps. And sometimes I find myself the following week to fill a gap from the previous week, and this year is to fill the gap. You see, the wife of an unsaved or a saved but spiritually slack husband has to fill the role of spiritual headship in their family. And I put the word there temporarily. That is a temporary arrangement as far as God is concerned. And why is it temporary? Because it is less than the ideal. Because the ideal is that the man takes the spiritual headship. But because the man nowhere to be found, he's not saved, he can't do it. So he can't be the spiritual head. So the women pick up the slack and temporarily carry that role. And praise God for that. Uh, you know, in these types of situations, this is acceptable, but not only acceptable, but it's necessary. Somebody's got to pray. Somebody's got to stand up and fill that gap. However, it is always God's intention to bring the man to the front spiritually and to get him to accept his role as leader in the family both spiritually as well as domestically. That's always God's ideal and God's intention to move the man along. Um, and how many of you men would say from time to time like that you're feeling like God's sort of nudging you to come to the front? And I don't necessarily mean physically uh, to the front, but that would be included. You know, we said, uh, uh, I think I might have told the story, I was in Africa a couple of months ago and ministering in the church there of Pastor Manetti and uh, Abigail Shishongi. Because uh, we know Pastor Manetti well because he was in our church here a number of years ago and his wife, uh, um, Lindy, Lindavi, came to visit him and we got to know her as well. And uh, I was ministering in that church and I was opening up the front area for people to come for prayer. Well, who comes down first? The women. This is generally the pattern. Um, I'm looking forward with thrill to the day when the men are the first to respond in any altar call, like, okay, God, here I am. Uh, you can count me. God wants to call men to the front. Um, I'm mindful that when uh, the first king of Israel was chosen, they chose Samuel, a man that was head and shoulder taller, um, Saul. Saul, thank you. Samuel was the prophet Saul. That's right. Um, thank you. Um, praise God for the um, helpmate. Uh. <laughs> so here is Saul, and they come to the coronation where the man is to be crowned the king, meaning the leader of the nation. And where is he? He's hiding behind the stuff. And if you read in the Old Testament, that is exactly the wording that is used. He's hiding behind stuff. <laughs> He's hiding behind some wagon or some stuff, some physical things. And sometimes men say, oh, yeah, but I'm very busy. Well, you be hi you're hiding behind stuff. You're be hiding behind your job, your responsibility to earn the money. And I know that responsibility primarily falls on the man in terms of pro providing for his home. And that's how God has intended it. And I always say, well, praise God for any income that, uh, that the wife is able to supplement towards the whole mix. But it is primarily the man feels that sense of responsibility. And that's a good sense. That is a God sense that God gives to man. If a man doesn't care about provision uh, for his family, then he's failed in, in, in that area because that is a, a primarily a main thing. Now, of course, we live in a modern society and we've heard that word equality so much that it almost annoys me. Um, and I'm not against women being given roles and everything, but there is kind of, you know, that whole politically correct thing. It sounds so correct politically, but some of it is so incorrect biblically that, you know, w women are like absolutely expected to go out and work and this and that and the other, and yet, yet uh, you know, for a wife and for a mother, particularly during the uh, years of the children being younger, this is like the primary responsibility. Uh, and yet we live in the real world and bills have to be paid, and sometimes it's just tough. Um, and, and so, again, I hadn't planned to say all of that, but, uh, but you know, the man feels that burden, uh, and that is a God thing. So God wants to bring the man out behind the stuff. Come out from, from all of that stuff and, and be the man 
that God has called you to be. Praise God. Anyway, some of you are starting to sort of stiffen up a little bit, so I'm going to move on right now. <laughs> it's interesting, but uh, I just, you know, sometimes we, in fact, uh, the man at the Schlegel household had a breakfast yesterday while the ladies was having a breakfast down here, and I just enjoy with uh, family coming to get at our house, and because the girls weren't there because they were here, and I just loved the men to come around, and we had a great breakfast, and uh, just uh, had a, a chat, I just you know, chat with the boys and just so enjoy that time. And I was sort of spending a little, a little time talking to, to Josh in regards to Vanessa's in my journey where, you know, where we were when we bought our first home in Wainu at that time. And uh, we had four children um, under the ages of six. So there's a few things going on you can imagine. Um, and yet we had decided that, uh, that though it was tough financially, we had decided that uh, it was best for us as a family that Vanessa was going to be a stay-home mom and that was going to give the kids the best chance rather than farming them off to somebody else. We thought, no, we're going to, we're going to do this. Uh, and uh, financially, it would have been advantageous for me to send her out uh, to go to work somewhere and earn some money um, and uh, farm the kids out to somebody else. But we said, no, this is what we want to do. Now, it sort of uh, meant that things in the early days and the earliest things were very tight. How do you know what it feels like when things are tight? Um, but, you know, we learned to get a hold of our finances back then. And, uh, you know, sometimes people visit us at our houses. And, wow, you know, like this is uh, something else. Uh, this is above average. And it certainly is. But I said, look, we didn't come here by having been high earners. We came here by getting a tight grip on our finances and by using our faith and believing God. That's how we got here. And people sometimes don't know the sacrifice. I says we even managed to send our children to, to give them Christian education. Now that made it doubly, doubly tight, but we, we felt that that's what God wanted us to do. And so what I'm saying to families today, don't come under the pressure from society, government or otherwise. You study communism and you will find that that whole thing of the woman having to go out to work, it's a communistic idea. It's part of that whole, uh, that whole uh, what do you call that, Charlie, thing that, uh, you know, that uh, <clears throat> communism, um, it'll come to me uh, in just a moment. That's where that idea comes from. Now, in some instances, uh, if the women are forced to go out because the financial situation just demands it, I'm not calling you a communist, you understand. All right, so just relax. I'm not here to accuse you, but I'm telling you what the ideal looks like that we should be aiming for. That's the ideal. Uh, and some, sometimes, you know, it's things are less than ideal. We've got to do what we've got to do because bills uh, need to be paid. But as I say, I certainly know what Vanessa and I had decided to do in those early years, and we're not sorry now when we're looking back. Um, and, you know, friends, don't live your life with regrets. Um, make good decisions. Make, make biblical decisions rather than economic-only decisions. Um, but, you know, I know the books have to balance. I understand that. I understand that. So, um, we're talking about bringing the man up from behind the stuff. <laughs> you know, I had a sense there um, when I was preparing for this message today that God was speaking to me in Italian. Uh, and I thought that was a bit unusual. And I kept on hearing the word secundo, secundo. Now, I'm Austrian by birth. Uh, my mother tongue is German. Italy is just to the south of us. Uh, I speak a few words Italian, but not because uh, I grew up in a neighboring country, but because my brother-in-law is Italian, and I've had Italian friends uh, uh, ever since I, my, from my teenage years onwards, I had Italian friends, and I really, you know, enjoy that whole uh, culture and everything. So I speak a few words uh, Italian, but anyway, God began to speak to me about that whole thing of uh, secondo. Everybody say secondo. Secondo. All right. What does that mean? Um, and I just threw that in there into the, uh, into the outline and I put it into a frame, not because it's more important than anything that we're saying. And friends, if it doesn't fit, just don't worry about it. But, but here's a thought. Here's a thought. In the music world, when a duet is sung by two performers, one is called the primo and the other one is called the secundo. Primo and secundo. All right. In the music world. Now, I haven't got a music degree, and I'm not, I'm not studied up in the area of, uh, of music at all, but I can read, all right? And I thought, God, what are you trying to tell me here? Like, secundo, secundo. Um, praise God for Google. You know, Google is good for some things, I must say. Not good for certain things, but very good for some things. Um, 
So what that means is that the primo is the principal part of the duet, and the secundo is the secondary part of the duet. Duet, of course, is when two uh, people sing, sometimes a man and a woman, sometimes two men, uh, more often than not a man and a woman. Um, and, you know, so the, the duet is a musical composition. Now, marriage is a composition. Have you know that if you're in the building industry, they talk about a composite board, where something is pressed together. It's not just uh, one single thing of timber. It's a composite. They press something together. Uh, in marriage, God presses man and woman, the pre press husband and wife together, and makes them one. All right, so it speaks there about the duo being a musical composition of two performers in which both the performers have equal importance to the piece, to the piece that they're singing. And this is where I was hoping to say before that when I begin to talk about primo and secundo, that you ladies hold your rocks and hear me out. All right, don't stole me now. I know I'm speaking about in politically incorrect stuff, and people say, oh, you know, it's like, you know, the women being pushed down. Yeah, I know that women are being pushed down, but I'm not one to push women down. I'm just, I want to go for God's order and God's plan and God's purpose. That's what I want to do. All right. Um, and so in the duet of a marriage and in the home, the husband sings the primo, the primo part, and the wife sings, sings the secundo part. Yet both of them have equal importance in the family and before the Lord. And this is never, and of course people say, oh, you're not telling us about, you know, like, you know, in, in, in shops sometimes when you go into the corner and they've got a little shopping trolley there and they've got the seconds in there, the damaged goods or something, seconds. You're not talking about that secundo. No, not at all. <laughs> this is never about superiority and inferiority, not about Firsts and seconds is we might understand it. This is all about having equal importance in the family. It's all about God assigned positions and roles and functions. And I say all of that to say this the God is assigned to the man the primo role. Everybody say primo. Primo. I'm not Italian, but I. I hear my brother-in-law, and he's just a wonderful man, and I just love hearing his accent. I just spoke to him yesterday, so I refreshed my own ability to speak Italian. Primo. <laughs> Secundo. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. I got to think, you know, uh, I just love music. I'm not very organized. People say, what music do you have on your devices? I say, none. I'm just not organized that way. But when I hear a piece that I enjoy, I enjoy it. Um, but sometimes I think I need to get one of my kids to help me with <laughs> lining, up, <laughs> lining up the music uh, so that I can listen to it. But, uh, you know, I, I just love singing, hearing good singing, uh, good music. Uh, I love uh, female vocalists, and I love hearing male vocalists, if they got a good voice. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but, but in my preference, in fact, we had a discussion a couple of years ago, and Vanessa says, you never said that before. I said, my preference is female vocalists more than male vocalists. Somehow preference. Not that one's better than the other, it's just my preference. But what I get really excited about is when I hear a duet of a man and a woman singing together to me. There's something powerful that happens. And particularly, we're talking about men being called to prayer and, and so forth. And you know, sometimes we focus on one thing and we don't mean to do it, but sometimes we speak of one thing at the exclusion of another. But you know, when a husband and a wife pray together, it makes a sound in the spirit that's very powerful. It's more powerful than just the woman praying or more powerful than just the man praying, when the two of them sing in the spirit. When I, I say sing, I mean pray. Um, I remember a number of years ago, I heard a husband and a wife uh, present a song in a church-type environment, and I was moved. Um, not just in my emotion, but I was moved in my spirit. I thought this was so powerful. Um, and... Uh, 
when men and women, husband and wife teams come together and pray together, it's very powerful. Now, because many husbands and wives don't pray together, uh, or they don't pray together a lot. Uh, Vanessa and I have had times together to pray, but when we first started out um, praying together, I just want to be practical with you this morning, so that we knew that we had to pray together. So, all right, let's pray. So we pray together, and we have a good time, and next minute I'm done. I'm finished now. Well, she wants to carry on for praying for another hour and a half. (laughs) But I'm already finished. (laughs) Because I'm a man. I'm a doer. I want to get out now and fix things and do something, you know. So, So there is an aspect where husband and wife have to be patient with each other and, uh, and uh, what's the word? Just understand each other's makeup. And it's not so much the length of time only that matters. It's the fact that husband and wife are singing together and creating a duet in the realm of the spirit that moves things. Um, and it's not so much the length of time one time or another, but it's the regularity of it that we come together, so we're going to pray about this. Let's pray together, and powerful things happen. Uh, We have a a discussion with our worship team quite regularly and frequently uh, in the life of our church. We catch up by sometimes pop down on a Wednesday uh, to join the discussions uh, before they start practicing, and I'm not a musician, and I'm not claiming uh, in any way that I can sing, but uh, I, I understand what's needed in order to to create an atmosphere. And uh, so typically there's a bit of an assessment that goes on, uh, and then you have some discussions around, you know, what we have covered on a Sunday, which is part of their small group discussion, and then they carry on um, and start their practicing. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, at one Sunday some time ago, we didn't have a bass instrument uh, on a Sunday in the morning. Uh, and the question was asked, oh, did you notice that there wasn't a bass? And I said, I personally didn't. Um, but I said, what I was missing was the male voice in amongst the vocalists. Um, and that's just, again, uh, uh, to a certain extent, a personal preference, but also a burden that we have men rising up in all areas in the life of the church to take their stand and to take, take their position. Um, and so for some reason on that day, we had, for various reasons, we didn't have men uh, on the platform singing. We had all the ladies, and the ladies make a wonderful sound. And praise God for that. But to me, to me, just purely looking at it from a natural standpoint, it's, it's, I just, you know, there's something missing. Um, and uh, I was kind of mindful that, uh, you know, ladies, it is said that women, vocalists, some of them can sing so strongly and so high, if there's a glass, a crystal glass, it'll, it'll just ping uh, because of that sound that's made. So women have a very powerful voice uh, if, you know, if they are inclined that way and, and if they train it and so forth. But uh, and that, there's a resonance there. There's a vibration that is released that's very powerful. But let me tell you this. Men have a bass voice. And there's something about a bass voice when prayer goes on. It creates a vibration in the realm of the spirit that goes beyond the just, you know, the fact that it's a deeper voice. And you know, we talk about praise and worship, we talk about singing, and sometimes men just, you know, just singing is just not their thing, you know. And uh, so we say, look, let's choose uh, songs that both male and female can sing. We don't want to, you know, there's already been over the years, and I'm speaking Western society, a, uh, an effeminizing of the church, that everything has become so female-oriented that men are starting to feel uncomfortable in the church. And sometimes the choice of songs is part of that. Um, and I just had a scary moment. I looked at the clock and I thought, oh no, this can't be right. I'm sure, I'm sure this is the devil that's moved that clock forward to half past. It's the devil. I know it is. Because I've got, uh, I've got so much more to say. And I didn't plan to say all of this. But uh, there is a powerful resonance. Resonance. There's a vibration in the spirit when men pray and when men and women pray together. Uh, it's very powerful. So, men, do not be intimidated because the lady 
is many times more fluent in prayer than what you are. And again, that is not uncommon. Um, it's not the fluency in prayer. Even if you stumble your way through it, the fact that you're making a resonance in the realm of the Spirit moves things. God is not impressed by the eloquence of words. God is impressed by the faith that is released from your heart as you pray. Amen. And so that's all about the duet and the primo and the secondo. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are we doing okay? I'm just lingering a little bit. Uh, as I said, this preaching is a little bit different than what I would generally do. I generally keep moving along, but I just don't want to miss anything because I believe that God is speaking prophetically uh, to a certain extent. Um, and, uh, and what I'm telling you, man, your voice is important. Your voice needs to be heard, not just in praise and worship per se, not just in prayer, but your voice needs to be heard all around. Um, so at this point, I want to swing into, um, and we haven't quite finished on that, but we may come back to it. <laughs> um, uh, at this stage, I want to swing into Deuteronomy chapter 16 um, and pick up a scripture there that is an Old Testament scripture uh, but there's some good thoughts, there's some good truths that I would like for us to sort of kind of bring out. And, uh, and uh, it would be very easy to swing into the New Testament and to find parallel portions in the New Testament to bring out New Testament equivalent of, so it'll not be difficult at all. So uh, I don't want anybody thinking, oh gosh, all we did today was look at Old Testament. We're just looking at patterns and the principles. Uh, we could spend time in the New Testament just the same. Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, it says, Three times a year all the males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. Um, God's speaking now uh, into the fledgling nationhood of Israel as a nation. There were slaves in Egypt. God brought him out under the leadership of Moses. Um, and because uh, they came to uh, Mount Sinai, also called Mount Horeb, Moses went up the mountain. He heard from God. He came down and began to teach the people and basically gave them the constitution for their nation. Every nation's got a, a constitution, uh, except New Zealand, they reckon, but I don't want to go there today. <laughs> so anyway, so he's telling now, okay, when you come into uh, the promised land, he says, this is how you're going to conduct yourself. This is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to watch out for. This is how I want you to treat men, women, uh, your servants. Uh, this is what happens here. Gave him the whole judicial system, just the whole works. Um, and here God is speaking about males. Everybody say males. Um, interesting, uh, uh, males have a male voice and should have a male voice. When a male is putting on an effeminate voice, something is not right. Um, something is wrong. In fact, it's tragic what you see on television today um, with um, men that supposedly have become women um, and, you know, with all the hormones and all the makeup and all the hairdos, you strip all of that away. It's the voice that gives them away many times because there's still a male voice there. Um, and God wants men to be men and women to be women. God does not want, want there to be a mixing up, a back and a forth, and to create a unisex being uh, or anything like that. God says, I created men, male and female. Uh, that is God's intent. Um, and to men, do not be embarrassed by your voice when you sing, God likes your voice. And it is not about the prettiness of it because you can't sing as well as what your wife, your wife might. God has given you a male voice. Sing with your male voice and do the best you can. All right? God likes it. Uh, the person in front of you might be me to be excited. <laughs> But we don't 
care about that because you're not singing to the person in front of you, you're singing to the Lord and God likes it. All right? Praise God. So God says, I want all the males to appear before me three times a year. Somebody says, oh, do we only have to go to church three times a year? No, no, no. It's not what we're saying. They still had the Sabbath day. They still had their Saturday, which was no work. Let the stuff, leave your stuff alone and on the Sabbath day and worship God and have family time and go to the synagogue and everything and, and so forth. Now, and of course, for us, Sabbath day is not applicable in terms of the Saturday. Uh, for us, Sunday is important. Uh, that's the day of the Lord. All right. So there's a, obviously a weekly aspect where God calls us together. But nevertheless, I was kind of struck when I read this that God says, all right, three times a year, I want all your males to come before me. Now, we're talking a whole nation. And he says, I want you to come to the place that I choose. Now, we know that the place that God had chosen was the temple on the Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem, which was up on a kind of a, uh, a series of hills. And Israel, much of it was low-lying. And, of course, in Bible college, we cover very well the whole aspect of, of uh, the, the whole ascent that they had to make to get up to Jerusalem. There was a little effort involved uh, to get up there and so forth. But God says, I want all the men to come uh, from all the surrounding uh, areas within the nation uh, three times a year. Now, they had their worship times, you know, where they live. But he says, I want all the men to come together from the whole nation. Um, <clears throat> So uh, they had to come together, and there's three things that are listed here, um, and uh, or certainly two, and the third one will be implied. First of all, to observe the Jewish festivals. There are three that are listed, uh, and of course there were others that were added to it. Some of them are biblical feasts, others are more sort of historical feasts where they celebrate certain aspects of it. Uh, so number one, to celebrate the Jewish festivals, to worship at the temple. God says, yes, you can worship at home, but I want you to come and worship at the temple and do that in this instance three times a year. And he says, I want you to bring me an offering. Um, and I'll have a look at that in just a moment. And that offering um, was to be in proportion to the blessing of God. Now, here's the deal. When man came from north, south, east, and there's not much west, but a little bit uh, in terms of Israel, the way it was laid out, they didn't come alone. They brought their wives and they brought their children. And here's the deal. One of the reasons why God didn't say, I want all the ladies to come three times a year to celebrate the feast, to worship before me, and to bring an offering, because the ladies would have come. And they would have brought their kids. But the blokes would have stayed with their stuff. So God says, I want all the men to come. And of course, when the men come, the women come and the children come because the man's the leader. The man is the one that carries the cloud. He's the one that's got the mana. All right? Um, and how do we know? Because, because one of the, in Luke chapter 2, it speaks about that Jesus' parents came up to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And they brought Jesus with them. So here's Joseph, the bloke. He would have said a couple of weeks earlier, Mary, get ready. In a couple of weeks, we're going up to Jerusalem. Bake some extra bread. We need some you know, rations for the journey, which taken days. And get ready. Um, we're going to go up to Jerusalem. And of course, Jesus is coming too. Jesus is 12 years of age. For those of you that have read through that part of the New Testament, you will realize that that was the time when after the festival was finished, the parents went home again. Jesus stayed in Jerusalem. He's in the temple debating uh, with the priests and with the Pharisees and with the people, and they were astounded at his wisdom. Now, there's multiple things in that whole one story, but man, you take responsibility to get your family to church and to bring them on time and to bring them in a good frame of mind. Sunday morning is not the time to argue. 
uh, as I say, people said, oh, you know, like, it's a disaster. You know, we've got a child now and we've got a second one. It's just a disaster. We just can't get out the door. It's interesting how Pastor Vanessa and I, we had four children. We were pastoring a church here. Pastor Vanessa laid out all the clothes uh, on Saturday evening. Sunday morning, it was like clockwork, and we were out the door. So what others can manage with, with four children, and, you know, if you need a little more understanding on that, you go and talk to Donna. <laughs> and, and today, they, they got a bunch of children, a few more than what we have, or talk to Margaret uh, and talk to some of these people. It is possible. It is possible. All right? You just need to organize yourself. But let the, the man be the leading force rather than the woman dragging the man uh, and trying to get down to Jerusalem to observe the, the, the feasts, to worship God, and to bring that offering. And the longer I preach, the more excited the men are getting in the house here today. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, at this point, and this is all about saying that if God calls the men, the women and the children come automatically. If God calls the women, it's only half the story, and only, only the half turns up. That's not to say that the men will automatically stay home. Of course, there's many men who will absolutely plow on and say, well, I want to be there as well, and we absolutely uh, want to do this. But as I say, we don't want to give men any excuses. And men don't make any excuses. Don't don't be slack. (laughs) At this point, I want to share with you some statistics. But only part of those statistics is happy statistics. And the other part is very unhappy, and some of it is downright scary. But I think it's important that we understand what's going on here. Over the years, uh, some of us men have heard stats um, in regards to the men, you know, being the spiritual head, or for that matter, not being that, um, and what that looks like in the family and the outworking of it, not just in a one week to the next week, but in the long term and see how the, the family fares and see how the kids turn out. Um, some of those stats are scary, I'm telling you. So this is nothing new. As Some of us men have heard this before, uh, but I think it's important that everybody understand what's going on here. Uh, so, you know, within Promise Keepers, uh, within Maine's ministry, sometimes in the early days we used to have Ed Cole um, videos, and he shared some of those stats. Um, Back in the 90s, there was a a study done in Switzerland. Um, And sometimes people say, oh, statistics, I don't pay any attention to it. You know what? If the Swiss do something, uh, they do things very well. (laughs) And uh, Vanessa and I were over there this year, and we're just, again, impressed by aspects of what we see there. And, you know, a central part of Europe and the meticulousness of how they do things over there. They've done a very comprehensive study. Uh, a whole book has been written, and of course ministers have come along and extrapolated out some of the information that I'm about to share with you. Uh, and so here is what that looks like. Uh, it's when men are leading their family spiritually or not. All right? The or not is in brackets. Um, research shows that the religious practice of the father in the family above all, determines the future attendance at or absence from church of his children. So a bit of a long sentence. What does all of that mean? Well, it means that, yes, it is important what the wife does and what the mother does, but in terms of the outcome for the children, where they will attend church or not attend church when they get on later in life, you know, teenage years and out the other side on into adulthood, it's what the man does is absolutely uh, influential uh, in the lives of the children. So the stats were then worked out, a series of questions were asked, and they figured out that if both the father and the mother attend church regularly, 33 of their children, 33% rather, of their children, gosh, I thought that's a, that would be a big family, 33 children, but it's 33% of the children will end up attending church regularly. And you know, that is... Uh, you know, we, we, uh, at a certain stage, we, we, we might decide um, to give children a choice. Um, Vanessa and I have done that at a certain stage when, you know, uh, children get into a certain stage in their teenage years. Looking back now, in one instance, I wished I hadn't given that choice. Uh, I wished that I had insisted. And, you know, a good saying came to me, of course, it's all hindsight and it's all a bit too late now. But I I should have said back then, while you're in my house, under my roof, 
it is off of my table, you come into church with us. We're going together as a family. Now, of course, you've got this whole thing like, oh, you know, it's like kids, you know, you're forcing kids and everything else. Sometimes it's just holding the kids long enough uh, in the right place until they start to develop a faith for themselves. And you know what? Sometimes people say, oh, you know, kids came home and, uh, and uh, children church is boring. Well, it's not that here, I can assure you that. We've got some brilliant programs going on in children church and youth, but in other places, children church is boring. So, oh, I don't want to go anymore. You know what? That was one Sunday, maybe just gone by. The very next Sunday could be revival. And if you allow your child to stay home, they will miss out on revival. And it could be, it could be a pivotal, it could be a defining moment in the life of that child. And one of the reasons why Pastor Vanessa and I have determined that we was never going to miss a meeting, uh, if church doors open, we was always going to be there, is because we are hungry. And we always want to learn more and we always want to participate and be a part of it. And, you know, the very service that was sort of, in a sense, an apprehension like, oh, you know, the very service that we, we might miss, you know, God might turn up and there'll be a major move of God and we miss out because we decided to stay at home. We wrestled uh, all the way to America with our four kids, all under six years of age. Uh, we had a trip going on. We went to Europe and we went via America and we went to Tulsa, Oklahoma and took our kids to the camp meeting over there with Kenneth Hagen while he was still alive. And, you know, it's a bit of a feat when you move around the world with four little kids. Uh, but, you know, anything can be done. You know, if you set your minds to it, remember, parents, you're in charge. Your children are not in charge. You tell them how it's going to be rather than letting them tell you how it's going to be. Um, so we wrestled all the way around there, and uh, <laughs> I could tell stories about, you know, Vanessa's sister told us that in Los Angeles airport, there's people that are losing their kids there, and, uh, and then they never find them again, and I'm traveling around with our, with our big trolley with all our luggage on there, and I got the kids sitting on top, and I got them all right within my, my, my <laughs> visual. Uh, there's nobody in my peripheral. They're all right in front of me, and I move along, and I'm counting kids. One, two, three, four. We got them all. One, two, three, four. Not lose any of them. <laughs> so anyway, so we went to the Kenneth Hagen camp meeting and we arrived there and, you know, the plan was that when we travel there and when it's, you know, flying time, you got this long flight and, you know, when, when the kids will sleep and we will sleep and we arrive at the other end, we're going to be fresh as it'll be no problem. Well, the, so, it so turned out that kids didn't sleep, so we were awake and when, when they slept, uh, it was all too late. So anyway, so we arrived and we'd like had it. But, you know, we are, we, are, we are young, we are strong, we can handle it. Uh, a little bit of sleeplessness, you know, we can get over ourselves and, and, and so forth. But the tragedy was that we, we, we just, one meeting we just missed, uh, one uh, meeting we missed in, in that whole conference. The whole conference was powerful. But guess which meeting it was where God really did turn up. God turned up at every meeting where God really turned up and, and sort of the more powerful things happened. Well, we heard about it afterwards in the testimonies and we heard about it afterwards on the tape, but we weren't there. So we made ourselves a promise as we were never going to miss another meeting. So just always look forward. It could be the very time when, when you decide to slacken up is the very time when God turns up and brings the answer and brings the solution for the challenges that you are facing because that's what preaching is all about. We're not just rambling on here, please understand. We're not just waffling. In fact, I hate waffling preachers. Uh, no, I love, the, I love the preachers, but I hate waffling. <laughs> We're bringing answers and solutions to life's problems. And when you're there, you're not there. Why should God repeat himself week after week after week to bring the same answer because you are slack? And you decided that it was better for you to stay at home. Because you watched sports into the middle of the night and then you couldn't get up in the morning. Come on now. <laughs> or played your stupid Xbox or something. <laughs> Let me start again with the stats now. So if both the father and the mother... How did I get sidetracked here? <laughs> I don't know what happened there. <laughs> Number one, if both the father and the mother attend church regularly, 33% of their children will end up attending church regularly later in life. Now, when it says later, it means that, you know, when, when children get into teenage years, they actually 
no longer children. God considers them adults. You see, and the Jewish society, that whole idea of bar, bar, bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah, is when a man, uh, a 13-year-old boy, was initiated into manhood. And he's now a man, but he's 13 years old. And we have somehow designed this category called teenagers, where anything is, is allowable, anything is possible. Kids turn from kids into adults. That's God, God's expectation. And so anyway, that could be later on in their teenage years, in the middle or later on, or in adult life. 33% of them will end up attending church regularly. 41% will end up attending church irregularly. So some of them are potentially likely to slacken off a little bit, but will hang on. And then 26% of their children will end up not attending church at all. Um, sometimes stuff happens and it is not because of the failings of their parents. It's just when people begin to make decisions for themselves. And they're adults for themselves and they have a free will for themselves. God's given them the prerogative to make up their own mind about their own life and their own business. But of course, we pray for them because if somebody doesn't want to be at church, they are deceived. So we pray for them. But anyway, these are the stats. Here we go. We swing into point number two where it says that if the father is irregular and the mother regular in church attendance, 3% of their children will end up attending church regularly. Now, I don't know if you're immediately scared by, by those figures, but I am. Because we've just dropped down from one-third, from 33%, we've dropped down to 3%. And 59% of their children will become irregular in church attendance later on in life. So now the figures are just, it's like just because the man has slackened off. It has an effect in the life of his family, not just immediately, because now he's no longer the spiritual leader, but later on in life it will have, in the outworking of it, in the lives of the children. And uh, as we said, 38% will not attend church at all. Now, number three, if the father doesn't attend church at all, but the mother attends regularly, 2% of their children will become regular worshipers. That's shocking. It's like how to lose a whole generation as far as church life is concerned. Now, we're not even talking about losing salvation. We're talking about dropping off church attendance. The whole aspect of salvation is not even up for discussion at this point in time. That's another subject, and we could go there as well if we had time. <laughs> but the number of people that are running around, have had an experience with God at some point in life, haven't been to church in 15, 20 years, and still expect to get to he heaven, it's just scary. So 2% of their children will become regular worshippers. 37% will attend church irregularly, and 60% of their children will be lost completely to the church. So somehow, father, husband, what you do has a major bearing in the outworking of your children's spirituality or lack of it. And in fact, uh, some of those stats could potentially be discouraging to women, I've read a whole article around that, and I haven't got the time and the space to get into uh, some of the other aspects. In fact, uh, in fact, surprisingly, and against all the, all the expectations, there are some further stats, and I said, we haven't got time to get into it. But in one instance, I said, if the father is regular church attendance and the mother doesn't attend at all, the stats of children ending up church later in life, the, the percentage goes up instead of down, and that defies all logic. Yet these are the stats. So I don't mean to discourage you ladies, but you can see why we are speaking to men, and you can see why we are praying for men to come to the front, to come out from behind the staff, and to take their place before the Lord. Three times a year, I want all the males to come before me, said the Lord. Because he knows that men will bring their children. And it's not even so much in the physical demanding of it. Children tend to watch their parents. But in regards to spirituality, they're really watching the father. They're really watching the father. 
And God's made it that way. I have no problem with a male-dominated society. I somehow think that that's how God likes it. God doesn't want to push women down. In fact, you will find that when Jesus came on the scene in the Old Testament, some of these guys had removed themselves from Scripture and they were pushing women down. And when Jesus came along, he had surrounded himself amongst other, uh, other people. He had the main there, but he also had women there. And he lifted them up and he gave them their rightful place in society and protected them. And, and when the, the Pharisees brought the woman that was caught in adultery, they were immediately getting ready to lay into her and to stone her to death. And there was no mention of where the man was. It was Jesus that lifted up women. But in terms of the whole biblical worldview of a male-dominated society, I see nothing wrong with that at all. Now, in a, in a certain sense, and to a certain extent, I'm okay with equality, but only to a certain extent. <clears throat> now, have you know that we're now in, in uh, politically incorrect territory? And the word that failed me before, and here it is, it's Marxism that has crept into Western society. And people wouldn't remotely consider themselves as communists. But Marxism and its teaching and its doctrine has got into Western society. And about that whole deal of, you know, the women forced to do things that really, really uh, are more the man job. And then, you know, the whole roles, everything is all mixed up and everything is all up the chute and everything is way out of kilter. It'll be interesting what society looks like when Jesus Christ will be the president, the ruler supreme in the whole world during the thousand-year reign that we sometimes, you know, the book of Revelation speaks, speaks about and when everything will be readjusted and everything is, that's out of kilter will be readjusted. I wonder what society will look like back then. Hallelujah. Are we doing all right this morning? So these are the stats. And somehow, man, if you are spiritually slack now, if, I'm not saying you are, but, but if you are, it will have a long-term negative effect in your family. And uh, <clears throat> moving on a little bit here, and uh, as I said, time is getting away on us. But uh, let me finish that verse here in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16 and 17, where God says to the man, All right, man, three times a year I want you to come. And when you do, do not appear before me empty handed. Now that's an interesting thought. It seems that God cares about whether we come with empty pockets empty wallets or empty hands and possibly a stingy heart or whether we come with something when we come before the Lord to bring something. What people sometimes don't realize is that there is this old teaching around that money is just mammon and God doesn't care for it and, you know, it's like let's separate ourselves from it and, you know, it's no wonder that large sectors of the church have been kept in poverty because of wrong teaching. Money is very important. It's important to us as people. It's important to families. It's important to society, to nations. And money is important to God. And when it comes to money, or whether that's, uh, that was just a means of exchange, or whether that was back then goods that they brought before the Lord, whether that was lambs, or whether that was grain, or whatever it was, when they brought their tithe, God says, the tithe is holy before me. An interesting uh, part here is that when he says, each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. So what that means is that the gift was not supposed to be a random amount. He says, bring the gift, or in another translation it says, give as you're able, but in proportion to how God has blessed you. So what does that mean? Well, God says, when you give your gift, look at your income and give in proportion to that. God says, the, the, look at your profits at the end of the year. And of course, they were an agricultural people. 
Uh, and incidentally, uh, when it speaks here about giving, it is actually specifically speaking about the tithe. Because some of those feasts, or one of those feasts immediately happened after the harvest time. And says, you bring in a big harvest, you bring in a big offering. You bring in a small harvest, you bring in a slightly, a slightly smaller uh, offering. Because so, so what we are saying here is that, uh, that the word proportion means that it is a portion of the whole. And the whole is all of our income. God says bring a proportion, or what we better understand is bring a percentage of your income. Don't just do random. See, the tithe is always a proportion, a preset percentage or proportion of the whole income. And it indicates here that God holds men responsible to bring the tithe into the house. And praise God for the women that have held the fort and for the women that have been the driving force behind that to do the right thing. But God says, I'm looking to you. This is a male responsibility. The tithe is not only money, it is a spiritual thing. And God looks to the male to be the spiritual leader to bring that spiritual thing and to bring it into the house and make sure, sure it is there in its entirety. That's why God says, bring you all the tithe. So the whole tithe into the house that there will be food in my house. So, this is probably as much as what we got time for. Because time has slipped away again. But I would like to encourage men to rise up. And I'd really like to encourage women, don't nag. It'll become counterproductive. You start nagging the man, he'll dig in his, his heels. Because it is generally not given to the man to listen to his wife when she's e trying to egg him on to do this, do that. Pray for the man. And as we said last week, be like Moses that held up that, uh, that rod before the Lord. And that rod is like you speaking in tongues and supernatural things begin to happen. And let another man deal with your man. Um, and uh, men are really encouraged to rise to the occasion. Many men are. But God says, I want all the males to appear before me. Not just some of them. He says, I want all the males to come. God doesn't want one single male to stay at home and say, oh, well, he can't be excused. There are no excuses for a single man. God wants all of them to rise up to take their rightful place within their family, to take their rightful place within the local church, to take their rightful place within society, within the nation as a whole. Let's uh, get ready uh, as we worship the Lord for just one more song. And uh, just as we are making a little transition here and we do that, we move from one segment of our service to another. It's kind of now response time. Uh, God spoke to us. He instructed us. And it's now kind of decision time. It's like, what do I do with all of this? And some of that can be a pretty heavy um, kind of responsibility to step into when, uh, you know, it hasn't uh, been functioning in the past. And say, oh, I got by, okay. And well, the reason why men get by is because women done all the praying. Many times. Because women have been standing in the gap to uh, carry things until the man rises up. But if you look around, and uh, if you were to, to look at a, at a male and a female, typically men got broader shoulders. God's made men spirit, physically stronger. But God also wants men to exert their spiritual strength and to rise up and to be everything that God's called them to be. Hallelujah. Praise God. We'll just bow our heads for a moment and I wonder if there's any man here this morning that would say, my heart's really stirred. And you just briefly raise up your hand and put it back down just to, to have some response, no matter how, how uh, easy it is to, in a moment of quietness, when nobody looks around, they just raise up your hands and say, well, that's me. I'm, 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 I realize I'm, I've been slacking up a little bit. I realize I need to step forward a bit more. Uh, some of you men, uh, you kind of, uh, 
You tried. I was sitting down with one man one year, and he tried a couple of times, and his wife criticized him and knocked him, and that just knocked him back. Uh, and he wasn't about to take the spiritual leadership again because he came under such heavy criticism. And so, ladies, if the man gets it slightly wrong, just be gracious. Don't shoot him down. He mightn't complain, but he might not uh, be excited about rising up in a hurry. Uh, yet God wants the man to rise up. God wants the man to come up behind the stuff, whether that's his job, his sport, his hobby, or whether that's his hurt or his own disappointments. God needs the, the man to come out. 